series, that Saturday magic. Could be a dangerous one if Charles gets to it. It's a goal. You have to say that this man was a phenomenon and would have been in any age. Yes. The jewel of the trial. I would say it was the first star of the match tonight, really. Gates again. I became a Swan supporter in the 1953 season, and my dad used to fetch me down. <laughs> the Woody Woodpecker song was popular, and as the Swans came on to the pitch, so they play it. And this particular day, they mislaid the record, they couldn't find it, so they couldn't play it, so we lost to Bristol City, uh, Bristol Rovers 1-0. Trevor Ford, they were all church, they all church, Cliffy Ewan, Terry Medwin, Harry Griffiths, Mel Charles. If they'd stuck together, they could have taken on the world. <laughs> the one man that stands out head and shoulders above the lot is Ivor Allchurch. I can remember in school right now to have my school book, Ivor Allchurch, you know. To me, he was the epitome of professional football. He was brilliant. <laughs> Once he'd take the field, more than 28 and a half thousand packed the stands on this cold and frosty afternoon. For a brief moment in the early 80s, a Swansea team successfully scaled the giddy peak of the first division. But older fans think of another era as Swansea's true golden age. The 50s, when Swansea turned out gifted players as if it were a city in Brazil, not Wales. Medwin heads it in, 2-1 to Swansea. In a fascinating alchemy, Swansea magically found itself in possession of the perfect recipe for producing intelligent top-flight players by the hatful, and all out of the small, working-class heart of the city. For the people of Swansea, the real Swansea is here, in the lower Swansea Valley, and it, it's, it's this part of Swansea which have led people to suggest that perhaps really Swansea, the essence of Swansea, is that it is a, a valley town you know, by, by the sea. Uh, I, I would say this is, this is the heart of Swansea uh, behind me, certainly the heart of Swansea as far as the footballers uh, are concerned. The district of Greenhill begat Tom Kiley. From Cum D came Mel Charles and Glyn Davis. Ivor and Glen Allchurch came from Plas Mal. Town Hill produced Trevor Ford. And all of them brought up within a free kick of each other. These communities had all the kind of distinctive features of, of the of the Southwest Valleys, if you like. There was a wonderful kind of intensity about them. They, they were cosmopolitan, they were people from a mixed um, uh, background. But the industries here and the schools here gave this area its, uh, its, its, its identity. Glyn Davis, Derby County, Swansea Town, Yeovil Town. My bedroom, I looked, uh, looked out the back bedroom window and I st looked straight over the park. And if I saw anyone in the park, I was out of, the, out of bed. Down to, uh, downstairs, changed and gone. Because that's where all the soccer was played and that's where all the cricket was played. And that's what our life revolved around. After school was playing soccer. Tom Kiley, centre-half, Swansea Town. I was born in Wynwen area of Swansea, um, which was mostly at that time the Catholic area. We used to play in the street or in the park. We used to go up to Cumbola Park and kick a ball around, or we used to kick the balls around in the streets, which you could do then because there were no cars. Beyond the parks and streets, soccer in Swansea schools was only played by youngsters in the junior schools up to 1944. Rugby was the game for the select, who went on to the grammar schools. But when the leaving age was raised, the newly created secondary modern schools chose soccer as their game. The round ball was what their children were playing with anyway, and perhaps they consciously didn't want to ape the rugby-playing grammars. There were two or three schools on this 
this side of the town, there was Oxford Street School right in the centre of the town, catering with the Sandfields area around the Vetch itself. There was Manselton School across there, there was Clan Samuel School up at this side of the valley, and then there was Town Hill School up on the top. So there were those three or four secondary schools, and it was there you know, that, that, that the great Swansea soccer legend was, uh, was, was born. Cliff Jones, Swansea Town, Spurs, Fulham, and Wales, and outside left. I failed my LM plus, and uh, the school I went to was secondary modern, uh, Oxford Street. We, there was no sort of, um, no rugby, there was all soccer. All the grammar schools, they, they were the ones that had the rugby. So failing my LM plus, uh, you know, uh, sort of in many ways stopped me from, uh, you know, getting experience in, into rugby. So the senior schools, the secondary modern, as, as, as they became, were for manual workers. They were for people who were going to lose, leave school at, at, at 15 and, and work. They were not going to be part of any kind of elite. So in a sense, it didn't really matter you know, what you, you, d you did with them. And there was a kind of conscious sense of filling in time. You know, soccer was the most useful way and easiest way of, um, you know, of, of, of doing that. Mel Charles, Swansea Town, Arsenal, Cardiff City, Port Maddock, Port Vale and Wales. We were all working class lads at the time, you know, and uh, as I say, you know, the game of football was probably uh, one of our greatest, greatest aspects, you know, that, that's all we had to do was go to the park and after school or in the school holidays, it was football, football, football. A tennis ball is kicked around the Manselton schoolyard. It's now a primary school, but this stretch of asphalt was once a breeding ground of great players like John and Mel Charles. We only had one ambition, that was to play for the school team, Kambula School, Manselton School, Stepney, as it as it was then, and you know, you rem and hopefully you move on from there. But your ambition as uh, eight, nine, ten, eleven was to play for your school team. <laughs> the teachers in those days seemed to have a little bit more time to look after us. <laughs> also, with the Swansea Schools Association. The teachers we had then, um, we used to really dedicated. They used to give plenty of time. We used to be training in the week after school, and we'd play on the Saturday morning. You played your street football, and then on a Sunday you get down the beach and uh, you, you play your beach football. And the different areas, like the Port Tenham boys, and you'd have the Sandfields boys, the Bryn Mill boys, and the West. Cro they'd all be out on the on the on the on the bay on Swansea Beach, and you'd see. It. A continual line of soccer being played. Exactly like it is in Coke Cabana Beach. Well, not so much Coke with Cabana Beach, that's the posh area. It's the sort of with the shanty town area where the kids spill onto the onto the sort of the, the, the sand there. And that's one reason why Brazil will always um We'll, we'll turn out top players because it's a way out for them. And I suppose in many ways it was a, a way out for the likes of some of us lads. Trevor Ford, Swansea, Cardiff City, Aston Villa, Sunderland, Newport, PSP Eindhoven and Wales, of course. Playing through the, through the school teams, they then picked me for the Swansea schoolboys, which was a selection from all the schools so it shows you achieved something because you were the best of the schools that they picked the players from. And of course, that was my first great honor, if you like. At the heart of every successful movement, there's a key personality. There were good sports teachers in the schools, but the full potential of these youngsters would have been lost, but for the Swansea Schoolboys Association League and its manager with a mission, Di Bainon. He was probably in his middle 30s in those days, a very, very highly respected man who, he had us all thinking that we ought to be a bit like him in our approach to the game. Well, I think Di was sort of uh, someone who always, you know, always gave his time up. Uh, always taught us values, you know, to play the game in the right spirit, play it to win, of course, but uh, if you didn't win, then it wasn't the end of the world. The secret of, of trying to impart knowledge is um, 
creating a situation where the people that you're there talking to understand what they've been told and kind of grasp it and can take it in. And he was able to do this in a quiet way. He had a gift. He knew how to call a player aside and say to him, come on now, son, you let me down. You let the school down. It's the way he handled you. And he didn't have to say any more. Once he said you were letting your pals down and the school down, you choked. There was a way of playing soccer in Swansea, and it was, a, it was get the ball, caress the ball, hold it, play it to people, play football, play it on the floor, play it in, in front of the fast player, in, play it to the feet of the good, skilled player, cross it to the far post and play from right half to outside left and from left half to outside right. So you turn in defences and defenders, these are all basics, but we were encouraged them to do this as kids. Di Bynan had a, 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 certainly a, a distinct style. I mean, he, in, in view of the fact that most teams played a similar kind of game with Di in, in charge, he might have been able to recognize it better than others and develop that uh, innate ability, if you like. But it was there, in my opinion, and. Uh, Di Bynan was very good at getting it out of them. He, he got the best possible out of the boy. The Swansea schoolboys were arguably the best in Britain. They thrashed teams throughout England and Wales, drawing crowds of up to 20,000 to see some of the games played at the Vetch. The Swansea boys held the ground record for a match on the Vetch. I think it was 28,000 they had against, I think it was Tottenham boys. The parents and mothers and fathers of the boys that were playing and the boys in the uh, reserves, they had friends as well and it caught on. It, uh, it was a popular thing to go and watch them. All I can remember is when I played for Swansea School, there always seemed to be 20,000 at the Vetch. I think over the years, you know, those people who did come got value for money, those people who supported us. And I, that's something which, you know, there again is important for the people who, who come and support to, to sort of uh, have that entertainment value, if you like. And they certainly got it with the Swansea boys. Starved for so long of entertainment, after the war, people craved for the experience of watching soccer and flocked in their tens of thousands to football grounds up and down the country. The Vetch got its full share. The city centre there was, uh, was, was flattened as you came into Swansea. When I first came to Swansea in the late 40s, you know, the bus would come a, a, along the road here and then you, you'd just see a big hole in the centre of Swansea, except for the Vetch field. And the Vetch field was there in the centre of that hole. They were rebuilding the town and the boys would come down on the buses. They'd come down on the buses from these communities into the centre of the Swansea and say, this, this is our town and the Vetch is the, is the focus of, of, of our town. The football authorities decided on an interim measure to usher in post-war football. Two leagues were formed, one for the northern clubs, the other for those from the Midlands and the South. And as a result, the Swans found themselves playing against some of the best clubs in the land. Crowds flocked back to the Vetch. There were 30-odd thousand there regularly to watch games, and scores like 6-4, 5-4, and so on. Really exciting. And that, during that period, of course, that Trevor Ford scored his 40 goals in one season. He was fairly slight. He was never a very, very big man, even when he was at the height of his international centre forward career. He was never a big man, but very, very courageous, very, very gutsy. Boy. But although he used to have a bit of a reputation for knocking people about, it was all just um, plain physical. Uh, strength, it was n the, never ever did anything dirty. I was a hard player. I never shirked a tackle. I went in. I had a little knack of shoulder charging the goalkeepers, which I used to enjoy because I never hurt anybody in my life and I've never been sent off. I never got a yellow card in my life, as they call it. And I've never injured a player. I frightened a few, but they frightened me too. I remember playing against centre halves from Scotland, Willie Woodburn, big Georgie Young. Just looking at him was enough to put him in a nightmare. He was fiery in, in, in every sense. Uh, he's a shot like a mule, uh, very mobile, brave, went in with injured feet to tread. Of course, in those days, goalkeepers didn't have the pr protection they have now. 
So Ford used to hit them with his shoulder and then they went into the net. Remember a man called F. Grave, playing for Southampton in the bench, six foot, six foot five goalkeeper, who's carried off on the stretch, everybody thought he was dead as Ford hit him as he went in. Another brilliant Ford goal for Wales. But it was you.